I think it is with honor, pleasure, but also a little bit of sadness that I will be introducing a man who basically does not need introduction. Um, I would say honor because of Xiaobing's excellent scientific achievements here at ERI, um, pleasure because he's a good friend, and the sadness part, of course, because this is an exit seminar. Uh, Xiaobing has accepted the position as full professor um, back in his hometown, in his home university, Wazong. Um, Agricultural University, and he will be taking up that position um, as of January 1, and he will be leaving here already, I think, uh, December 21. Um, here are some of the, 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 the formal <coughs> statements about his career. Now, I've been basically asked to also in my introduction summarize some of Xiaobing's highlights here at ERI. Um, so I have about 50 slides. <laughs> but I found Xiaobing willing to explain them himself. So I will be here only for, for to, to basically run you through some of this. So as you can see, um, Xiaobing, is, um, his education is very solidly grounded in four different universities, studying agronomy and physiology, starting, like I said, in his home university, Wazong Agricultural University, uh, moving to UC Davis, um, Texas University and then um, University of Florida. Uh, after these um, um, eight, eight years or so, eight, nine years, um, Xiaobing thought he was ready um, to join Eric. And since, 90, uh, since 20 years ago, basically he um, holds every conceivable position that we have had, starting as a visiting scientist and then moving through associate um, physiologist and associate scientist a COP physiologist, um, IRS position, and now senior COP physiologist. Um, and I think if Xiaobing would have stayed uh, more than these 20 years, he would surely move up to that um, <laughs> principal scientist that is reserved for, for, the, for the best of the best. Um, career highlights, um, there was only a little bit space left, so the organizers decided to, to focus on a few. Um, I think that um, probably one of his sig most significant achievements, it's not even there, and it is that after working 20 years at ERI, um, Xiaobing still looks young and very dynamic. <laughs> and I don't know how he does it, but I do hope that he can impart some of his tricks um, to the rest of us who still have many years ahead, hopefully here at ERI. But um, Xiaobing has backed two CGIR awards, one of the uh, promising young scientists, and the other one, um, just a few years ago, designed the board for the outstanding scientific paper. And if I'm not mistaken, that was the paper that um, described the effect of high nitrite check temperature on reduced yield. And I'm sure that Xiaobing will touch upon that uh, in his seminar. And um, he's a uh, fellow of the American Society of Agronomy and the Crop Science uh, Society of America. And he serves in the editorial board of um, few renowned journals, and last week Xiaobing explained everything about the impact factors of these journals and how you could um, manipulate them uh, to some extent, and you can see he must be a master in doing so. <laughs> so um, I won't say uh, much more, um, there are about 87 slides ahead, we have 45, 50 minutes of doing so, and I'm fully confident that Xiaobing will keep us um, fully entertained in the uh, time ahead. Thank you very much, and Xiaobing, the floor is yours. Thank you, boss. When your division head introduced you for seminar, that's a bad news, Miss your Nibi. <laughs> that's exactly what I'm going uh, to do in a few weeks. Uh, today I will just talk about the, my experience uh, on the crop physiology research on the intensive rice, in intensive rice system at Erie in the last uh, 19 years. I will start with uh, this uh, definition of uh, crop physiology. Uh, crop physiology studies uh, plant processes to understand the functioning of the plant at the crop level in this uh, interaction with the other plants in the crop and also with its uh, environment. So you can see some keywords here, processing, uh, processes, crop level, interaction, and the environment. So those are the keywords when you define the crop physiology. 
a very famous uh, crop physiologist, uh, Professor Noel Evans, he described uh, two phases of crop physiology. One, phase, one is the crop physiology has to look towards the agronomy, including the improving the efficiency of water and the fertilizer management. Another phase is uh, looking at the uh, plant breeding. For example, identify and analyze the processes which limit the advance in copy years. In 2004, uh, CG uh, published a mission and objectives. In that uh, uh, document, it described uh, for the commodity-based centers in the CG system, there's a twin pillar of the CG-supported research. One is productivity, and another is natural resource management. So this pretty much matched with what we just talked about, two phases, except that all is different. In Professor Noel Evans' case, he put the agronomic first and then the breeding. But in this case, in the CG system, productivity in terms of plant breeding, crop improvement, and increasing yield potential become more important. Uh, natural resource management, including resource use efficiency, crop management, cultivation, and farming system, also needs as another uh, pillar of the CG supported research. So you can see those are very important. In my last uh, 19 years research in the year, so I pretty much uh, made my uh, roadmap in my research area and uh, direction according to those uh, uh, strategies. So I do rice crop physiology research, try to provide the scientific support to crop resource management, which many economists, economists does, and also supporting the breeders for crop improvement for breeding. So the goal is try to increase the rice yield potential and also at the same time improving the resource use efficiency. So over the years, in terms of physiology uh, research, I've done many things. Photosynthesis, radiation use efficiency, mix and essence, and also study transpiration and water use efficiency, uh, nitrogen, nutrition, metabolism, grain feeding, and plant hormone, nitrogen resistance, and also a little bit of crop modeling, QTL mapping of the morphophysiological traits, and also study the there's uh, 15 pounds of, uh, per hectare per season rice yield, which happened in Yunnan province, to study what is the physiological basis of uh, such high yield. And also spend a lot of time on climate change related issue. Started with the UVB project, and then they uh, focus on high temperature. For crop resource management study, I developed this uh, real time uh, nitrogen management, and also worked on site specific uh, nutrient management with other year scientists and uh, studied a little bit on the uh, shift night and uh, with the strategy of healthy canopy management. And also in the last year, I started working on the AWD and the nitrogen interaction, so water nitrogen interaction. On the crop establishment, we did some study in the early 90s on direct seeding, mainly on the uh, uh, wet seeding. Very interesting. I also did some study on the SRI, even though many steer scientists didn't like S doesn't like SRI. But I did this study uh, with my collaborator in China. And also some study in China on the zero tillage and straw management in collaboration with Dr. Burash. And a very interesting study we did, a small study, but it's very interesting on golden snare control by using the different age of seedling and the seeding numbers per year. And we can control the golden snare, golden snare effectively. So all those have been published. On the crop improvement side, I Working on a new plant type, the yield type approach, try to improve the yield potential. Also, working with our hybridized breeders on hybridized study the physiological mechanism of the hydrosis. Aerobic rice, the sustainability of aerobic rice, try to uh, save water, but still maintain the relatively good uh, rice yield. Study the grain yield of historical yield cultivars, and to see what, what, does it, uh, what is the trend of this yield potential for those. Uh, uh, historical year cultivars. Uh, spend some time on cold tolerances. Basically, the screening of the cold tolerance in the in the greenhouse, and I study the genetic variability in nitrogen use efficiency. And in the last two years, I was focused a little bit on green supervise. The green green supervise really trying to increase rice yield and at the same time cutting the inputs. But I'm not going to have time to cover all of this. So what I decided, I'm just to just pick up five uh, cases, which I think uh, can highlight uh, my research at the year, which I believe had a little bit more impact 
and also its scientific need and uh, both scientific need and the practical need. I'll start with uh, the NIC M nutrition, some basic of physiological study and also the establishment of a uh, new strategy of uh, nitrogen management. And I'll move on to the high temperature study. And uh, the third one is the decline of IR8 and the, the possible causes. Number four is the clear stability of aerobic rise. And finally, I'll finish up with the, the development of new contact line, give you an update, and also what is our new direction for, for the new contact study at the evening. So I started with the case number one, dry sleep and nutrition and uh, nitrogen management. And I'd like to start with this picture. Many of you have seen this many, many times, but I still like to show this one. Why? Because when I came to year 91, my division head, Dr. King Kessman, is a Shaolin, this is a toy, plays play with this. And uh, we cannot get this done right. So when we do this, uh, try, when we use this for analyte to try to determine the nickel uh, end concentration, we get too much noisy numbers. So please work out on this. So I took this machine, and this is a small machine, and uh, my whole career for the unit started with this machine. That's why I, I want to start with this. And this is a nickel counter chart. We also use this. Uh, for the farmer's beer, when the farmer cannot buy this one because it's too expensive. So when I get to the machine and I took measurements by myself, when you're, when you're new at the unit, you do many things by yourself. So I did the same thing. I took measurements with a spot, with a chloroquine meter. And I, I noticed that when the leaf is a little bit thicker, I can feel it with my hands. And then I can find that the reading is higher, give me higher output. So that gave me some indication, maybe the leaf thickness has a big effect on this spot reading. So this is just a proof that my, my feeling was right. So this is a data set. This is a dry weight based on uh, dry weight based on the N concentration. This is spot reading. And this is a the middle thinning stage, early stage, middle stage, late stage. So each within each stage, the correlation is pretty good. Okay. But when you pull all the data together, the correlation is very poor. R squared is only <coughs> around 0.5. Okay. So based on my observation of that deep thickness effect. So what I, I did is uh, I normalized this spot meter, uh, spot reading with a specific nip weight, which is the weight divided by nip area. And once I do that, all three lines put together, you can see the R square increase from 0.5 to 0.9. Huge increase. So this is the first time <coughs> in any crop we discovered uh, the importance of nip thickness affecting the, the spot reading. Later on, we also find that leaf thickness also have effect on the leaf uh, color chart reading. So when the leaf is thicker, the LCC will give you a high reading, but doesn't mean it has more nitrogen concentration for you in the leaf area, okay. for you in the uh, leaf driveway, sorry. Another important figure I can share with you is this one. We are following a very high yielding rice crop throughout the season. What we find is that the the leaf thickness is a gradually increased, so the old leaf is thicker than the young leaf. But on the dry weight based end concentration is gradually decreased because of dilution. But the spot reading or the leaf area based end concentration stay pretty constant okay, throughout the season. So this gives us an indication we can use maybe only one threshold, the spot threshold, to manage our nitrogen in the field. And you can see there's a there's a the old management system with the based on powder. Total N is a, a different stage, you have a different threshold. Okay, this is a California system. Okay, so you have many thresholds. With the new system I proposed, with a spot uh, meter, we only need one threshold. For example, for most uh, IR varieties, we use 35 for the LCC of even LCC meter. We only need 3.2, and uh, which correspond to the leaf area based in concentration 1.5, 1.4 gram per square meter. Once you maintain this level of leaf end status, you don't need to plant any more nitrogen. The crop is safe. It will give you high yield. So we tested this one at the year in the Philippines. It worked out very well. And because of the variety we category, when we know that. But when we test this system in China, this one, this one didn't work very well compared with the uh, site-specific nitrogen management. So in, in China, we decided not to push on the real-time end management, which I, which I developed. We decided to push this one, the site specific uh, nitrogen management, which is developed by our team, by Christian Wee and Dr. Ronan Borash at the event. So, this one is basically is feeding the crop based on the need uh, in terms of nitrogen. In this case, it also considered indigenous supply and also considered climate. But for the 
what I discussed, uh, discovered in the in the SPA the reading and the, the, the lift and nutrition, it is uh, providing the scientific foundation for judging the crop need for nitrogen in this system. Just to give you an example, when in the SSNM, when we decide how much nitrogen we apply, we use this uh, uh, northern meter threshold. Okay. If it's greater than 36, we only apply 20. If it's between 34, 36, we apply 30. If it's less than 34, we apply more, apply 40. So, so this is a, this component of SSM is really based on our our scientific study on the spot reading and the end nutrition. So, in China, we have a, a try to ex extend this SSM technology in seven provinces throughout China, and it's showed a very effective. And we started with on farm field trial and on farm demonstration. And also we use the farmer uh, participatory, uh, uh, participatory uh, farmers research approach. Now we're in the stage of a large scale uh, extension. And the key research funding is that we, there's a very high indigenous air supply capacity in China. And uh, we apply nitrogen. The end response is very low. It's only 1.5 pounds hectare. Many farmers apply too much nitrogen, especially in the early stage. And we, some, we often see the yield reduction in China because too much end supply due to pest damage and technology. And uh, if we use SSM, we can improve the rice yield and also increase the nitrogen use efficiency. Uh, with this uh, improved end management, it, uh, it continuously it does not reduce the yield in your subsequent uh, rice crops. And this technology was uh, uh, yeah, officially evaluated uh, by export panel in China. And uh, on average, the fertilizer uh, for the excess element was reduced by 20 to 30 percent. And compared with, with, with farmers practice, grain yield increased by 5 to 8 percent. So now the extension is really going on in Guangdong province and also in Hunan province in a very big scales. Now move to the sec uh, second case on the high light temperature study. This is the data from our EV climate unit. So thank EV climate unit provide this data. This is the annual mean temperature from 79 to 2009, uh, 31 years of data. And uh, the, the weather station was started in, the, in 79 at the unit in the wetland station. So you can say maximum temperature did not change that much. In 31 years, only 3.37 uh, degree uh, in 31 years. However, minimum night temperature increased, in one, increased by 1.33 degrees in 31 years. 31 years. Let's only focus on the dry season, what's happening in the dry season. Dry season will really use the average from January to April. In dry season, again, maximum temperature not much increase, not much change. But night temperature, in 32 years, it increased to 1.62 degree. That's very high. If you put it on, on, on 100 years term, that is about 5 degree increase in night, minimum night temperature over 100, over 100 years. So what is the implication of this increase in the night temperature? The green yield is reduced significantly when you increase night temperature, okay, but uh, with, with no relationship with the maximum daytime temperature. Radiation, not a very strong relationship. So this is a paper that the bus bomber just mentioned was published in the PNS in 2004. And if you look for the above ground biomass, and it has linear relationship with minimum temperature, no relationship with maximum, maximum temperature, and a poor relationship with radiation. Okay. And from this linear relationship, we come come up with the biomass uh, declined by about 10% for each one degree of increase in growing season minimum temperature. Okay. Assuming the house index does not change on the warm night temperature. So that means the uh, rice yield decreased by 10% with a uh, uh, one degree increase in night, uh, night temperature. So this statement has been used by the IPCC when they evaluate the impact of a future global climate, ch climate change on crop yield. And based on those studies, we also established that it's a critical night temperature and radiation for the green yield at the year farm. If you try to get a more than seven pounds to try to reach eight pounds, you need to have average night temperature, minimum temperature, 24, less than 20, 23, I'm sorry. Okay. And then if you want to move your yield from eight pounds to nine pounds, your radiation becomes better. So you need to have 19 megajoules square meter per day average throughout the season from transplanting to the, to the harvest. You may ask me, uh, how did you come up with this uh, uh, night temperature? The importance is just uh, by chance? No, it is not. 
In 2001, okay, uh, August 14, I sent a report in the Empire Institute. I reported this year decline in the last three seasons at the Erie Farm, which is 99, 2000, 2001. And you can see this is 72 years. It's a ratio historically lower. And also, this is the best entry, also lower than many others. So, this is the year. This is the green year. And I analyzed the data of the, uh, on weather station. Of course, these three years have, have a lower radiation, but more importantly, it has a very high minimum night temperature. Okay. So, from this, it gave me an indication the night temperature could have, could, could have something to do with this year decline. So, in my memo to the whole institute, I mentioned many times about this night temperature should deserve more attention. That's the whole reason I come up with this, this 2004 uh, paper in the PNS discussed the, uh, described the importance of night temperature. So it, this has not come from nowhere. It's really um, intrigued by the, the poor year, year in 1999, uh, 2000, 2001. <coughs> okay, after our paper published, and there's many paper uh, published in the very important journals describe the importance of the night temperature. This is a study published in the PNS 2006, and they studied the uh, uh, wet season yield data in the India in nine uh, uh, rice growing states in India, and they find that, uh, of course, this is rain and rice. Uh, rainfall in June and September is the m number one uh, factor for the rice yield. Uh, the second important one is the October November minimum temperature. That's the second most important one to determine the, the rice yield in that area for the rainfield rice. And this is another study recently came from India. And this used the weekly transcounting between June and August. And they find that this uh, 32 minimum temperature of 32 is a critical. If it's greater than 32, you get a yield reduction. If it's less than 32, you also get a yield reduction. So this critical number of 22 is pretty much the same to what we find at the unit. So ours is about 22, 23. And there's another uh, study just uh, came out this year, uh, used the year's data set. This data set is based on the 227 farms managed feed from six rice growing countries. Actually, this data was, this was done by uh, Akim Doberman and Chris uh, Wee many years ago. And they took this data set and did some analysis They find that the heat minimum, so this is the uh, light temperature, has the hugest, biggest effect on the rice yield especially in the right knee phase, compared with the maximum temperature, compared with radiation. So this also supported what we reported in 2004. More interestingly is the, in Mexico, they used the similar data on a, on a weak year. It's also a historical data set in two sites. They find the delta T uh, minimum temperature is the most important one to explain the yield variability compared with the maximum temperature and also radiation. So light temperature is more important. Uh, very funny, they come up with the same statement. Roughly 10% yield reduction for every one degree increase in minimum temperature. So completely different crop, different location, came up with almost the same results. So we continued our night temperature study by building this field chamber at, uh, at the Erie farm. And we tried to, so this is daytime, and then we opened the, 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 the chamber, nighttime, we covered this uh, and with the aircon and manipulating the temperature inside. So based on this chamber study, we were able to uh, find that IR8 is more sensitive to the higher night temperature compared with IR72. You can see the yield reduction with the high temperature uh, is only 7% for IR72, 35% for IR8. And also in our recent screening study, uh, we found that many varieties has the ability to tolerate this high night temperature. And of course, many varieties are very sensitive. The sensitive variety, they reduce the yield because they have reduced the sink size and also reduced the grain feeding percentage on the warm night temperature. And those are the uh, tolerated ones, for example, N22 is very, very interesting. N22 is a variety is very famous for heat tolerance. So they have a, they maintain a good uh, grain feeding on the very higher daytime temperature. So we also added another uh, uh, property for this one. So it also has the ability to tolerate the night temperature. And the period 29 is a, is a variety which also reported as a very good resistance to the many abiotic stresses. Now we move to the, uh, the third study, the third cases. Uh, the third case is talk about the yield decline of IR8. 
and the possible causes. This is a bigger, also quite famous of the event. Many people use this, especially by breeders. And this shows the uh, year trend of very uh, historical varieties. Those are varieties which has a big impact in rice production in the world, such as the uh, IRA, IR36, IR64. And you can see this is a year of release and this green year. So, so the, the new variety has much higher yield than the older variety when you grow, grow, when you grow them on the current condition. So physiologists and breeder, when they interpret this data, they have different uh, answer. For, for physiologists, we will see our oh, yield potential has not changed uh, since uh, uh, the release of IR8 because it's stemming in uh, eight tons, uh, 10 tons hectare. Breeder will see we're making great good progress in the, in the increase in yield because the yield is uh, uh, gradually increasing. Both are right. Both interpretation are right. <coughs> and if I compare the IR8, which was uh, this nitrogen response curve of IR8, which was done in 1968 compared with the one I did in 1998. So 30 years difference, and you can see that the response is totally different across the entire range of nitrogen input. Okay. So zero N, the yield difference, especially when, when the, the 120 kg per hectare, this uh, uh, 1968, it produced nearly 10 tons, but if you do that now, it only give you a, a seven tons. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that just indicating the IR8 is just not doing the, the same job as uh, it does it did uh, 30 years ago. So we compared the IR8 with the best of varieties uh, in 1996, 99 uh, dry season. You can see the IR8 yield is always lower than the than the best of varieties, except this year. As I just said, 99 was a very poor year. Yield potential is only is very poor, so we didn't see much difference. So then we try to ask. Uh, what, what happened with the IR8? Why IR8 uh, cannot produce the same year as uh, 30 years ago? So I came up with a very good idea in 1998. I thank for years uh, GRC to provide this uh, IR8 seed, which was harvested in 1968. Okay. And they stored it in Jinban. They only stored 20 grams. They were able to spare uh, 10 grams for me. And then I multiplied this IR8, and then I get enough seed so I can compare. Uh, this uh, gene bank stored IR8 with a continuous grown IR8. And this is a field study I did. So this is gene bank grown IR8, uh, gene bank uh, stored IR8, this is continuous grown IR8. You can see vegetative stage, low difference. Uh, PIF stage, low difference. Harvest stage, low difference. The nitrogen response curve is dead even. Okay. So in terms of performance, field performance, there's two uh, different uh, IR8 seed sources. Give me a, a two identical, uh, give me identical results. So this is all the data we compared uh, for four seasons between the, this two IR8 with the best variety. 2000, 2001 are poor years, so we don't worry about this data. There's no difference because the year potential is very poor. So 2002, 2003 are uh, two good years. Okay. So you can see the best variety produce much higher yield than IR8. More importantly, two IR8 did not show any difference. Okay. <coughs> Uh, with the uh, with, uh, uh, help from his lab, we did some SSR analysis about this two, uh, um, this two uh, IR8 seed source. SSI, SSR detected a variation in about 12% of IR8 uh, continuous from IR8 seedlings, but now in the IR8 uh, uh, gene bank stored IR8 seed. Okay. So we grown this, uh, uh, after the SSR test, we grown those plants all the way to maturity in the greenhouse. And this is a gene bank grown IR8. This is a con uh, con this is a two continuous grown IR8. This with the uh, SSR variation. This without SSR vari variation. And uh, with your eyes, you don't see any difference, even though there's a SSR uh, variability. They're identical. We measured the photosynthesis for this three seed sources, and the photosynthesis rate in the different stage they're dead even. And we also see no difference in plant height, chemical size, green finish percentage, seed weight, body dry weight, harvest index, and green yield. So morphologically, we see those IR8 from two different seed source, they're identical. So that pretty, give, pretty much gives us an answer, what is the, the cause of the, the, the yield decline for IR8. So there's only three possible reasons. One is the biotic stresses, the change in biotype of disease and then the, and the insects. So the IR8 cannot tolerate those new, new biotypes. So that's one possibility. But we, in our experiment, we, we control our disease and insects very intensively. 
So at least we don't see visual, uh, visual damage. The second possi uh, the another possibility is genetic change in the seed itself. And based on study just conducted, we rule out this possibility. So that only leaves the second option, the uh, second possibility, which is uh, uh, ABR stresses, for example, uh, changes in climate such as night temperature and also changing in the soil quality. And for this study, we cannot, uh, cannot pinpoint which one it is, but we know it's ABR stresses. So what is the impl implication of this uh, study? It emphasizes the importance of maintenance breeding, even though our continuous breeding has not increased yield of pension, but it was able to maintain the yield of 10 pounds back up to yield level. Secondly, uh, when we talk about maintenance breeding, normally we talk about biotic stresses, disease, and insects, but this study also indicated abiotic stresses can be also important and for the maintenance breeding. And uh, this study also suggests that climate change may erode the genetic gain in crop improvement, so the breeder should continue to do the breeding to almost like a, a race uh, with the climate change to be able to maintain the rice yield. Finally, and uh, many breeders all see, oh, when the seed, when the new variety come out for five or six years, then the seed will deteriorate. This variety was not good anymore. Then you have to, with it. You have to go with a new variety. So this is a variety deterioration, even though people have this perception. But uh, we're the first, in the first time, we, we prove that's not possible, does not exist scientifically use, using this method. Now, move to the aerobic rice. In 2001, we established a, a, a medium-term experiment on aerobic rice. This was done in the Challenger project, project the, name, the name of the project for the STAR project within the Challenger program. And Dr. Bas Boma is, the, is the, the PI of this project. So I had a very good experience uh, in working with him in this project. So this just showed this show the year trend of this uh, medium-term experiment. This is a green year. This is the, the, the year. This is the dry season, this is wet season. And you can see the, the, the red one is the green yield of the aerobic rice has gradually decreasing. But if you put on a relative term, relatively the yield of a irrigated rice, and the difference is even bigger. So gradually, the difference is getting higher, both in dry season and wet season. So this indicates when you grow aerobic rice continuously, you're going to get a yield reduction. And you can see this yield reduction mainly because the biomass uh, production is reduced on the continuous uh, aerobic rice. And this is a 2001 dry season, aerobic of natural rice, not much difference in, in the biomass accumulation. In 2002, and you can see some gap. 2003, gap is getting bigger. 2004, even bigger. So you can see gradually, you can see the soil become a problem and the, the aerobic rice does not uh, function as well as uh, the early, early, early years. Even though with this, uh, this is such a nice data set, but we still not be able to convince everyone there's yield decline in the aerobic rice. Then what we did is, uh, in 2004, we changed the design of this whole experiment. And I think it, right now, I think it's still, I think this is a very good idea to be able to do that. What we did is that uh, this field has grown a aerobic uh, rice for the previous six seasons. We suddenly convert this one into the aerobic rice. And here is the aerobic rice for, for seven seasons, for seven seasons. So now we can compare the first season with seven season aerobic rice in the same field on, on the same condition, <coughs> same environment condition. The only difference is that the history of the soil is different. The previous crop is different. And then this uh, one is not rice used uh, as a control. And you can see in the, in the, in the next stage, this is the first aerobic rice, first season aerobic rice, seven season aerobic rice. You can see, maybe you cannot see where this one is very poor, this one is very good. And this another rice, of course, is the best. And if I give you just a, a close up, this is the seventh season aerobic rice, first season aerobic rice. Very clear difference in the performance. And just give you the data. First season aerobic rice, 6.3 tons per hectare. Very nice yield. The seventh season, only 3.8 tons. The difference is about 51%. So a huge difference. Even without any, you have 40% difference in the, in the yield between the first season and the seventh season aerobic rice. So that's really. Key point, I will maybe just uh, really confirm that there's a yield decline uh, in the continuous aerobic rice uh, cropping system. So then we did many studies in the, in the laboratory, in the, in the greenhouse, uh, by using this uh, soil. So what we did is that uh, this is our aerobic poor soil, sick soil. And, uh, after 11 seasons of growing aerobic rice, we grow aerobic rice without any input. 
to produce very poorly. But if you put the soil in the oven, just use the oven to treat the soil, it grow like this. So this is a rock rice. For flat rice, if you do that, you can also get some improvement, but not as much as the aerobic rice. So this indicates that the soil is really sick, but then what is the cause of the sickness, we still didn't know. So we tried many things. We tried a, a different nutrient, micronutrient, and also P and K, many things. But uh, finally, we find out that this nitrogen is the, one of the main reasons to cause the sick, uh, uh, not a cause, has some association with the soil sickness. And you can see this is a zero, zero end, low end of night, this is control, sick soil. This is the oven traded soil, so this is another control. So you have a, two controls, this is the best control, this is the worst control. But with the ammonia uh, uh, sulfate application, we're able to almost uh, get 80% of this uh, performance. So this really indicates that nitrogen is one of the limitations in this uh, sick aerobic soil. So after those studies, we're able to be able to come up with this uh, uh, hypothesis. Maybe the N deficiency is one of the uh, possible causes of the yield decline in continuous uh, aerobic rice. This can be caused by N availability or the N uptake ability. Okay. Availability reduces because of maybe soil change. And we observe that when you grow aerobic rice for many seasons, the soil pH increase. Okay. When you acidify your soil, and it will give you better performance. So that's the indication of soil uh, 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 availability reduced. For uptake, uh, for uptake ability, ammonia toxicity and the nematode, they can all cause and reduce the end uptake ability, then which give you the yield reduction. Now move to the the new plant type. <coughs> I had a uh, I had a privilege to work with Dr. Kush on the development of new plant type in the early 90s. And uh, in one of my review paper, I have summarized the, the good feature or bad feature of the MPT lines. Uh, a good one is increase sink size, improve the margin resistance, and also reduce the unproductive but the, on, the, on, the, on the negative side, it has poor grain feeding, uh, reduced the biomass production, and uh, poor compensation ability, susceptible to disease and insect, and also difficult to stretch, and uh, has a poor germination, and a poor uh, grain quality. So those are the uh, analysis on the new contact. But despite those negative uh, aspects, the MPT still has uh, uh, still made some uh, uh, impact. One is a few MPT9 has been released in Indonesia, China, and the Philippines. And even MPT9 has been distributed through, uh, distributed through uh, India to more than 90 countries for evaluation. And many breeders in the national system has used the MPT9s as parents in the breeding program. And another important uh, uh, story is that there's a China's uh, uh, supervised breeding uh, started in 1996. It's really stimulated by the US MPT work. So now the question is, uh, if we really want to uh, increase the rice yield by another 15%, it is, it is, is it possible? It is possible, but we'll have to do many changes. On the yield component side, we'll have to increase the technical size. Okay. And we'll have to maybe have the screen size a little bit also a little bit increased to be able to give us a, a, a high yield. In terms of process, the yield, process of the yield formation, and there's another way to calculate the yield increase. We cannot change the irrigation, which is fixed. We cannot change the crop duration, because if we increase too much, and then you can get a yield reduction. So 110 days in the main field is the optimum for the highest yield. But I'll have to make sure we we'll have a very good night conception. So the canopy has to capture as much uh, radiation as possible. So on the whole season, our target is 70%. Once you intercept those radiation, we need to convert those in, into the biomass with higher efficiency. So the radiation efficiency has to be maintained above 1.5 gram of biomass production for megajoules of radiation interception. Ox index maintained 50%. So if we can achieve this, it is possible for us to produce 11.5 pounds per hectare. So at the area, we're discussing some of the new strategies uh, with our MPT breeding. One is uh, follow the Chinese experience in donor selection and also consider the utilized hydrosis. Uh, uh, and emphasize more on the top three leaves and also the position of the panicle within the, within the canopy. Use multiple trays instead of a single tray. Consider uh, compensation among the different trays. So those are another, that's another strategy. 
and uh, we're also discussing about imposing the selection pressure in the early generations and the develop uh, measurable indicators to be used in the selection by the breeder in the nursery. And finally, when we're right now we're expanding and standardizing the uh, modern location yield trials. So the 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 pump trait uh, proposed pump type trace is not much different from the previous MPT work. So it's still early vigoring, moderate kinetic capacity, and thinner leaf in the vegetative stage, quarter pounds and no organic high thick strong stem for nitrogen resistance, direct thick dark green, V shaped leaf, high leaf index in uh, leaf sense innate leaf senescence in the late stage and also have large and compact panicle due to the heavy green weight and the longer green feeding duration. So we also have all those traits here. But what I did is uh, try to give some value on those traits. Okay. And uh, I come up with 40, 45 traits, okay, including the three uh, I call the secondary traits. So those 45 traits, uh, 40 some traits, I divided into four, four groups. One group is the important traits. And also, it's easy to measure by the breeders in the field. So, for example, panic number, spectral number, and green feeding percentage, those are relatively easy to measure. So, and I put in the value, the target value for yield increase improvement. So, I'm not going to go through all of this. I will just leave this here so our breeders can use that, and hopefully, they'll use that. Second group, they're an important trait, but not easy, not easy to measure by the breeders. For example, total biomass. Crop growth rate, if I index, if the license, relation use efficiency, house index. So those are very nice uh, traits for the physiologist, but it's very difficult for, for, for breeders to measure. They're very important. If you want to increase rice yield, you have to focus on them. And the, th the third group, not very important, but it's easy to measure. For example, leaf number, leaf length, leaf weight, and the shape, and the erectness, and the length, and the number of uh, primary branches and the secondary branches. So those are very easy to measure, but they're not very important compared with, previous, compared with the previous two groups. The, the four, fourth group, not very important and also not easy to measure. Deep thickness, maximum kinetic number, kinetic percentage, and the spectral number of panicle length. This is the compactness, com compactness of the panicle, high density, high density gradient, so many. So I also have all the values here. And those, all those values are based on my study at the ERIC for the, in the past 19 years, and also based on the literature. So those are three secondary count traits. So I just put the numbers here so the breeders can use in the future. So there's also some lessons for the supervised uh, varieties that come from China. So when we do our new count type breeding, we should also remember those lessons. One is that the new the supervised may have a poor nitrogen use efficiency. And they also had reduced the early vigor because of the kinetic production is reduced and the poor compensation uh, for disease and the insect damage. And also it requires a very, very intensive crop management, also needed a high input. So all those has to be uh, taken into consideration in our MPT breeding. Also, there's some many scientific uh, issues when we talk about the increased rice yield potential. And one is how much room we really have left in the plant type uh, improvement for achieving a higher yield potential. And uh, if you can deep senescence and extend the green feeding duration, you, can you really increase the rice yield potential? Source sinker relation, which one is more important? And uh, can we improve the rice yield uh, by improving the radiation use efficiency through so the higher force rate, such as safe or rice? And also, finally, what is the real impact of this uh, new molecular uh, <coughs> technology in, in our yield potential work? Now, another question we may ask ourselves, uh, do we have a better chance compared with uh, uh, 10 years ago on, uh, in our new contact reading, try to break the yield barrier? I'm pretty positive about this. I have uh, five reasons. One is uh, I think we have a better understanding of high yield, high yielding plant trees. And also, uh, there's a very, very successful story in China in the yielding type reading. And also, there's a wide range of geoparts with uh, target trees become available as a donor parents nowadays compared with 10 years ago. And uh, as I just mentioned, all the target plant traits are becoming quantifiable and measurable. So I have all the values put in there. And we're, extend, we're extending our market location year trials and also try to standardize that as also a positive news. The more importantly, it's a bet, better funding situation. And even though the year potential is a very important work, but in the past, we didn't have much money 
to work on them. So nowadays, with a better funding situ situation at UWIC, so we can uh, have a more uh, <coughs> support for this kind of research. Of course, uh, those are the five uh, cases of uh, study I did at UWIC. And after 90 years, of course, you have some regrets. So I will summarize with that. Uh, summarize those uh, regrets. Uh, I have to say, in the 90 years, I had a, we had a pretty good understanding of uh, nitrogen nutrition, but we were pretty weak in the carbon assimilation and the metabolism. So we did a pretty good on the nitrogen side, but a little bit poor on the carbon side. We uh, focused uh, uh, well on the whole plant physiology, but I had a very limited uh, use of the molecular biology uh, approaches. For myself, I focused more in the East Asia, but I had a limited contribution to the South and Southeast Asia, and I emphasized more on the favorable ecosystem, but I neglected a little bit on the fragile ecosystem. So that's also some regret. And I'm not a very successful in application of large project funds, such as the climate change, I still remember Duncan told me when I had that PNS table, Xiaobin, you're going to get a big project then for climate change, but I never did <laughs> after that table. So that was that, that's just a, a, a regret. Another one is I never achieved a grain yield over 11 tons per hectare at the yearly farm. I've always tried, tried many ways, but still could, was not successful. Okay, so just uh, for my replacement or other people who work on the uh, physiology, my yearly device, some uh, suggestion or advice. We need to continue to work with breeders in identify non high traits that increase residue potential really work with breeders side by side. Study the biological and genetic control of physiological traits that determine the process of yield formation. We have a lot of information about the bio biological and genetic control of the morphological traits, but a very few physiological traits. But physiological traits many times more important than, than those of morphological traits. Try to establish a high throughput and a precision and phenotypic system for both field and laboratory study to really support the molecular uh, study, such as molecular breeding. Understand the mechanism of varietal adaptation to climate change, and this has become more and more important. The varietal adaptation and maintenance breeding is really crucial if we want to meet the, the challenge of climate change. Explore strategies to increase wet season rice yield with focus on shading tolerance. This one I just started this, this season, but I'm leaving, so I hope someone can, can continue this study because our, our water becomes limited. So try to increase rice production in wet season become more important because of what water shortage is not a major issue in the wet season compared with the dry season. Finally, increasing the right radiation use efficiency by improving the photosynthesis at both canopy and single leaf levels and also by suppressing the respiration. So this is a little bit more strategic research. It takes more time. So we need to uh, work with the C4 group, the C4, uh, group more closely on, on this aspect. Okay, some numbers uh, for me to remember. Okay, for the past 19 years here, I have, I've gone through uh, 38 rice growing seasons, both dry and wet seasons. Uh, every season we do many experiments. So in the Philippines, I've done 169 field experiments. And I've spent almost 7,000 days uh, with the urine. So I have so many people I need to thank for. I start with uh, the top. So I have gone survive. I survived the three, uh, five DGs. Okay. <laughs> so Dr. Nampe, Dr. Rothschild, Dr. Fabinder, Dr. Kentrell, Dr. Zigner, DDGR, Dr. Uh, Fisher, Dr. Kosin, Dr. Ring Wang, Dr. Tong, Dr. Kim Doberman. And then my division head, because for me I'm working the bottom, so division head is more important for me than those boys. <laughs> <laughs> so started with Dr. Tasman and uh, Dr. Jim here. Dr. Ito, Dr. Tong, and Dr. Bastoma. And I uh, really thank them because they really protected me very well, make sure I have enough resource to do research, make sure I'm not too back, uh, too spend too much time with the uh, administration. So, big thanks for them. And uh, I have collaborated with many even scientists over the years. Uh, as I said at the beginning, for physiology, I need to face in the agronomy side and also in the breeder side. So in our own division, of with Dr. Kassman, Dr. Goresh, Dr. Doberman, Dr. Vergara, Dr. Pastoma, Dr. Esmer, Dr. Nada, Jiang Shihi, Christian Wei, okay. I may miss some more. Uh, on the breeder side, Dr. Kush, Dr. Umani, Dr. Borg, Dr. Shea, 
and the Dr. John Bennett on molecular physiology. Now, the most important part is my, my own group. So they are the one that really helped me a lot, and they made a huge contribution to uh, my achievement. So I started with Romy. Romy will retire next year. He will be working with Yiri 43 years by next year. So as uh, Dr. Randy Barker said yesterday, uh, Kyle Moya and uh, Romy Biscos, they really represented our Institute of Memory. Bex Naga, Bex is the one that uh, started with me when I started my whole shop at Yiri. I had only one research assistant, and she's the one who started with me and then stayed on here now. So I really thank her. And the Senta is my third secretary. And another one I need to mention is the Alex. Alex is my field uh, technician. And uh, about 10 years ago, he wanted to join the stock separation. I begged him to stay because it is so important for our field experiment. And I also have uh, uh, many uh, former staff, uh, staff members with my group, and especially Emma, my first secretary, and my second secretary, Owen. And unfortunately, I had a, a three uh, staff member uh, passed away. Also, I'd like to take this uh, opportunity uh, to thank uh, uh, my family, my wife, and my, my uh, two kids. And then they are the one who can make my life uh, happy. And uh, also, uh, I'd like to thank uh, many other year uh, management, uh, top management, uh, like uh, Dr. Bernardo and uh, uh, Dr. Padanina. So they really uh, also helped me. Now, I'm going back to China as a uh, bus set, and this is my building, quite a big building. And uh, so this is called Cop, Cop, uh, Cop Science Building. And uh, this is the Cop Physiology and the Production Center. This is my center. So I call it CPPC. In the future, when you see the, you heard CPPC, and that's me. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, uh, thank you for your attention. I used a little more, too much time, 47 minutes. <laughs>